scientists get a lot of inspiration from nature. And while you might be really afraid of spiders and other creepy crawlers, their webs are something really unique. So next time when you walk past the spider's webs, imagine that if this would be normal human sized, it would be strong enough to capture a narrow plane. So spiders have the two really unique properties. First of all, they've got to be really strong and then they've got to be very flexible as well. So what happens? You have a honeybee that flies in at full speed. As soon as the bee hits the web, the web stretches out, which it can do because it's so flexible. And this way, spiders' webs can deal with the impacts of insects flying into the web. Because imagine if you have like a strand of hair, then you only have like one teeny tiny lock of hair, one strand, then a thousand times smaller and even smaller than that. And that's what the kind of length scale you're looking at. Scientists have made use of this in order to make materials that are very strong. So think of Kevlar, which is used in bulletproof vests. If you look at the structure, there's actually quite a lot of similarities between spider's web and that material. So here you can see the structure of Kevlar. It contains a lot of aromatic groups, which make it very rigid. And you can see it's aligned nicely, just like a fiber. Then you've also got hydrogen bonds in between, which ensure that the strands can interact with each other. And how does it work? Well, I'll try and explain that using something like spaghetti. Think of spaghetti when it's not cooked. When it's like that, you know, it's very rigid, it's very stiff, it's very difficult to break. And you can also nicely align this in the structure that you want. But then the disadvantages you have, remember if you have this honeybee fly in, it does break like that. Yeah, so it's a brittle material. It's not flexible whatsoever, so it can't withstand a lot of impact. Why is that? Well, we have the uncooked spaghetti, and think of spaghetti when you cook. So once you cook it, it's all tangly and it can stretch really well. So this is what happens in spider silks. You've got regions where you've got both this crystalline structure, which makes it very rigid, and then you make it very flexible as well. They have in regions in between. Actually, unlike what you might think, spiders don't spin fibers, they squirt them out. So they squirt out a little bit of material and... Well, and the key to some of the properties that we don't understand might be in this production process. So you have to imagine you start off with a water-based solution in which you've got maybe like 30-40% of the actual polymer. So then when they make the webs, what happens is that you get a transition. You go to something which is water before and then becomes a solid. And it's an irreversible transition. The easy thing you can probably compare this to is by cooked egg white. Once it's actually cooked, you can never go back to the other stage. You have something which is water-based before and then it becomes a solid. So this is quite unique in nature and it's a very clever way of actually making those webs. So the best that we've done so far is by using animals to do this. First thing you would think of, why don't we just use spiders? Well, you have to imagine that spiders are cannibals and they would eat each other if we put them in close proximity. So the most common example, or the best well-known examples perhaps, is the spider goat. They use similar technology as for Dolly the sheep, where they transfer the gene that codes for the spider silk protein into another animal. But you can imagine this is not a very easy process and for very good reasons, there are very strict regulations around the use of transgenic animals. So the idea is to transfer this technology to other microorganisms that are either easy to control or they can grow really fast. So examples would be, for instance, bacteria, plants, and also the option of silk horns is being quite often used. The first application where we're going to see spiders perhaps seems to be in clothing. So the reason for this is that can you imagine something which is completely biodegradable and made from sustainable sources? I don't know. In the next couple of videos, we're going to go into more details in how everyday nature scientists get inspiration and what products have been developed as a result of that.